pleasure to introduce our uh, speaker today and the uh, distinguished lecture of the Institut de Microtechnic here at EPFL. And we are directly connected from the Lausanne campus also to Geneva and uh, to Neuchâtel today. So uh, our speaker today is uh, Michael Dickey. Uh, Michael has received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering uh, from Georgia Tech uh, in 1999 uh, before uh, continuing with a PhD equally in uh, Chemical Engineering, uh, but this at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, where he graduated in 2006 before continuing then uh, as a postdoctoral fellow uh, with George Whitesides at Harvard. Uh, he started then his own group uh, in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering and NC State uh, in uh, 2008, where he is since. And we are very excited uh, to learn today about soft, stretchable, and shape programmable materials uh, for electronics and actuators. So please uh, welcome Michael Dickey. Thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. It's really an honor. I'm very excited to be here. Um, is everything okay with the audio? You can you hear me? Okay, great. So before I get into the technical content, I thought I'd, since I'm so far away from home, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about where I'm from. So I'm a professor at NC State, as Niels indicated. So this is a map of the east coast of the United States. And so right up here is New York City, and down here is Disney World, just to kind of get you oriented. So we're sort of in between there. This is North Carolina, it's the, the green state here. And NC State is right in the middle of the state. It's the capital of North Carolina. And I looked up, um, North Carolina is about three to four times bigger in terms of area than Switzerland. Um, so trying to give you a, a, a you know, size scale here, but we have about the same number of people. <clears throat> it's about, about the same size. If you go to uh, about two hours drive to the east, we have very beautiful beaches. And if you drive about three hours to the west, we have quite nice mountains, although compared to the Alps, they're, they're you know, not as quite as nice. But um, anyway, um, Raleigh, which is again where NC State is, right in the middle of the state, uh, a few years ago they did a survey of the best places to live in the US. And believe it or not, they actually ranked Raleigh, uh, you'll see, number one. Uh -oh. Did I offend somebody? <laughs> I said this one time with somebody that was from New York and they got very upset. So, uh, But by some standards, Raleigh is, is a very nice place to live. And I've always been very proud of being from Raleigh and thought it was just a wonderful place until I came to Switzerland. And so now I'm having some second thoughts and I might just want to stay here if that's okay with you guys. <laughs> Uh, given our current president, I think maybe I could be a political refugee. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm kidding. Um, so our university is about 33,000 people, so it's quite large. We're the biggest university in North Carolina, uh, known for our engineering. This is the, the building that I sit in. It's an engineering building. And uh, one of the buildings we're very proud of is our, our uh, library. And one of the things that's special about it is in a traditional library, there's a lot of, a lot of wasted space with the, the book stacks. So here they've put all the books down here in the basement and there's actually a robot that will retrieve the books for you and kind of go and pull them. So all the space that you see, they call collaborative space for studying and for students to work. So in, in our group at NC State, we work on a number of things, kind of interdisciplinary. And uh, the common themes are the importance of interfaces, patterning, microfabrication, uh, and soft materials. And I'm gonna try to tell you kind of just at a very high level about two of the things that we've worked on. The first one is, is work on liquid metals. So we'll focus most of the talk there. And so the motivation for this um, should actually be sort of close to home for, for some of you in the audience. And that is to try to make electronic materials that have interesting mechanical properties. So you know, your, your laptop, your cell phones, these are all made out of rigid materials. But if you could start constructing them out of materials that are soft, flexible, or even stretchable, can start to do some interesting things. So this is, um, in the top left, this is a concept by Nokia. It's a cell phone that could be wrapped around your wrist like a watch and then be unfurled and, and used. Uh, one of the leaders in this field is John Rogers and he has done some really cool work with very thin electronics like uh, temporary tattoos that can conformally mount against the skin. Uh, again, one of the leaders is Stephanie LaCour, who's I think listening in, and uh, done some implantable devices that are uh, soft and stretchable and conductive. I'm giving some other examples, um, also from, from Switzerland, um, Herb Shea's group doing some soft uh, grippers and actuators. 
as well as some work from, uh, from ETH making flexible electronics. And you'll notice that there's a few words here, flexible, soft, stretchable. These don't all mean the same thing. And I would argue that making something flexible in principle is, is very easy. And, um, and I say this with quotes because in reality there's of course some challenges, but in principle, if you take a rigid material like a piece of wood and you make it thin enough, you have a piece of paper. And so this is an experience from day to day life, everyday life. Um, and then same thing with aluminum, this is a bike frame made out of aluminum. If you make it thin enough, you have aluminum foil. And of course these things are flexible because they're thin, but they're not stretchable and of course they're not soft. Now there are some ways to make metals stretchable and there's some examples also from day-to-day -day life. Uh, this is kind of a relic now, but um, cords on, on old-fashioned phones used to be stretchable because they were designed sort of like springs. You can also use things like meshes to make things that are rigid to be stretchable. And also you can make corrugated structures to make things stretchable. And so there's some examples of doing these sort of macroscopic concepts on the micro scale and uh, I was going to embarrass Stephanie a little bit. Um, she's one of uh, the creators of one of these technologies using microfractured uh, metal films to, to make them stretchable. It's a very clever solution to this problem. So this is one strategy. Another strategy is just to use composite materials. If you want to make these things stretchable, so if you, uh, you can use composites. So for example, these are sticks of cinnamon, but if you imagine these to be conductors, um, and you pulled on them, they would be able to move simply because they're not uh, physically connected. They're just in contact, but they're not physically connected. And you don't necessarily have to use uh, sticks. You could also use spheres. So um, this is just kind of a fun picture, but uh, if you imagine these spheres to be conductive and you start moving them around, you still have a percolated pathway. And this is exactly what's done on the nano and the micro scale. If you use, say, silver nanowires, as long as you have enough of them, you can create a percolated pathway, and if you put them in elastomer, you can make the thing stretchable. Of course, this comes out of trade-off, which I'll come back to in a second. The third strategy is to just use a material that is inherently soft and stretchable. And so the thing that typically you know, would come to mind is something like a liquid. But of course, most liquids are not very conductive. Uh, salt water is pretty conductive, but not nearly as conductive as, as a metal. So, uh, so then that begs the question, could you do this with liquid metal? But when you hear the term liquid metal, what comes to mind? Just shout it out. Mercury? Okay, you're too smart. <laughs> Something from uh, Hollywood. Terminator. Okay, you are smart. Good. So, both of those things, Mercury and the Terminator, captured in this little clip. So this is the former governor of California. Uh, who's just blown up the bad guy, so that's Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, he's just blown up the bad guy, and the bad guy is kind of creepy, turns into this liquid metal material that comes back together and reassembles and turns uh, back into the bad guy. So I show this mainly just for fun, uh, but it's obvious that when you're watching this that you're looking at science fiction. You know, liquids don't go uphill, liquids don't adopt these types of shapes, they tend to be spherical. And in essence, this is what we would like to to try to do, of course not for evil purposes, but we would like to be able to pattern liquids in shapes that are useful for electronics, such as wires, antennas, etc. And so, of course, the answer is we can do this, and we're not the only one. There's a lot of work being done on liquid metals around the world. Uh, our group is just one, and uh, so this is highlights from other groups. I'm not going to go through them because they're not our work, but I will point out that there's some very nice work being done at uh, EPFL using liquid metals. And if you're interested in kind of digging deeper into some of these applications from other groups, I recently published a review paper that goes into uh, a, lot of these, a lot of these different works. Now, I will, will mention uh, one work in particular, and part of the reason I'm, I'm here in an extended time in Switzerland is there's a thesis defense tomorrow. Uh, hopefully everyone knows about it, but if not, this is a little advertisement, and this is a really nice thesis that goes into some uh, new uses of liquid metal, so I hope you can attend. We'll also just do a little bit of advertising and say that, you know, again, a lot of people are now working on these materials, which is very exciting. And last year in the um, CNE News, this is a, a journal of the American Chemical Society, they published a list of top 10 kind of hot research areas and liquid metals was, was one of them and they featured some work from our group as well as other people. So uh, this is just to say that um, I know liquid metals is sort of a kind of a new thing in many people's minds, but um, a lot of people are starting to work on these. Okay, so how do you pick a liquid metal? 
I think most people know that mercury, <coughs> excuse me, mercury is a liquid metal, but mercury is toxic, so we don't want to use that. Over on the left-hand side of the periodic table, there's these guys which are um, either radioactive or explosively reactive, and so we don't want to use those either. And so really by process of elimination, um, you know, someone shouted out gallium, and uh, that is indeed what we're using. And you'll notice that gallium is right below aluminum on the periodic table. So this makes them sort of brothers or cousins, makes them have similar properties. But there's one big difference, and that is gallium has a very low melting point. And so this is a crystal of gallium, and so this is what it would look like if you saw it in its solid form. Its melting point is low enough, though, that if you were to hold it in your hand on a, on a hot summer day, you would find that it wouldn't melt. But to ensure that it stays as a liquid, we add some indium. And this is one of the you know, wonders of nature. One, one plus one equals three. Here, 30 degrees plus 157 equals 16. Okay, and so basically by adding this to it, it depresses the melting point, And we use a composition that's called the eutectic. The eutectic, in this case, is 75% gallium and 25% indium. Now, a few comments about this material. Its viscosity is twice that of water. So you can think about it being metallic water. It has zero vapor pressure at room temperature. That's remarkable because that means you don't have to worry about breathing it or, ha or having it disappear into the air. It just stays put. And you might be thinking, well, it's a liquid metal. It must be toxic. But I would argue that toxicity does not correlate with melting point, right? And so um, it turns out if you Google gallium injection, um, I wish that the first thing that popped up was my website, <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, the first site that comes up is an NIH website, and it says gallium injection. Now, this is a little bit misleading because it looks like this person's injecting gallium into their arm. Uh, that's actually not the case. This is a gallium salt that's been FDA approved uh, for MRI contrast agent, so it's okay to put gallium into your body. Um, and you know, if you, if you take a vitamin in the morning, let's say an iron supplement, for example, you're not actually eating iron, you're eating an iron salt. Otherwise, the metal's not going to be soluble in your body. So this is some gallium salt that your body is able to handle and remove, very much like iron, actually. And in addition to that, um, this guy is a collab uh, collaborator and colleague of mine at NC State. He came to me a few years ago and said, can we use liquid metal as for drug delivery? And I thought that sounded crazy. I was looking at him crazy like you're looking at me, <laughs> like I'm crazy. And it turned out to be a pretty good idea. So he used uh, little liquid metal droplets to deliver drugs into the body. And the, the point was that we, of showing this is that we were able to put it in mice and the mice are still happy today as far as we know. Okay, so, what's, so the most important property of this material is that it reacts with air to form a very thin oxide skin. And to, dr to drive home this point, I'll show you a video. So this is the liquid metal spread out on a glass slide. You take a little, uh, little bit of acid, one molar hydrochloric acid, and the vapors from this, this Q-tip remove that oxide shell, and when it goes away, the metal just beads up. Okay, so this is the mo probably the most important slide of my talk, so hopefully you follow this. With the oxide, you can spread it out on the surface, but when you remove it, the metal will just beat up. Now, what do we know about the oxide? It's about three nanometers thick, so it's a, not a perfect analogy, but imagine filling this room with water and having the paint hold it together. Okay, so it's very, very thin, and it's so-called passivating, which means it forms and it does not get thicker. I think in reality, it, it, it does get a little bit thicker with time, but for you know, all intents and purposes, it forms and stops. Same thing with aluminum. If you take a sheet of aluminum out of your, your kitchen cabinet, it's doesn't, you never see rust on it. That's because it forms an oxide and it stops. And remember that we've added indium to this material here to depress the melting point, but the surface is composed of oxides of gallium. And to kind of drive that home, uh, we actually have done a little bit of surface science on this material. And if you take it straight out of the bottle, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details of, of what you're seeing here, but if I'll just focus your attention on this bar chart, if you take the metal out of the bottle and look just at the surface, you'll see that the surface is primarily oxygen, gallium, and a little bit of indium. So the point is, even though there's indium there, it's the gallium that's forming this oxide layer. What's interesting is if you scrape off that layer, in the absence of oxygen, the indium actually becomes enriched at the surface because it has a lower surface energy, sort of like a surfactant. Then if you add air back into the chamber, you'll see that it goes back to being oxygen, gallium, and a little bit of indium. So the bottom line, the takeaway from this, is that the surface is pretty much always composed of gallium oxide as long as you're working in air. 
Now one more sort of detail about this material to, that is important for understanding, understanding the way it behaves is to understand its rheology, the way that it flows. And so we've uh, done some very simple measurements where we put the liquid metal between two plates. So this looks a little bit like a cookie, where the bottom part of the cookie is stationary, the liquid metal is sitting there, and then we squish it with the top plate, and we rotate that plate back and forth and measure how hard it is to turn it. Now, usually, if you do this, and you do this with, say, jelly or honey or some other fluid, it's a bulk measurement. But in our case, it's actually a surface measurement. We're actually measuring the oxide that goes around here because the viscosity of the metal itself is so low. It's similar to water. It's very much like if I move my hand through the air, I don't really think about the fact I'm moving through a fluid because the viscosity of the air is so low. Same thing for this instrument. So let me show you this video. This video shows the liquid metal, and here we tell the instrument to turn to the right, turn to the left, and then we let it go. So I'll play it one more time, and you'll see that the oxide is present. You can see that it sort of wrinkles, very much like if I grab my shirt and pull it back and forth. And the other thing is when we let the plate go, you see it kind of snaps back. So it's got this a little bit of elastic character to it. And so this is the kind of data that comes out of these. We basically wiggle the plate back and forth, and we can get the elastic modulus, which is plotted on this axis, as a function of stress, basically how hard you, you push on the material. And the takeaway from this is that the skin is elastic. So this is kind of like uh, Hooke's Law from freshman physics. It's like a spring constant. So it's a material property, and it's elastic, it's elastic. And then when you push too hard, the oxide breaks, and the metal can flow. So this is very much like ketchup, if you will. If you're below this stress, it holds its shape, and if you're above it, it will flow. And so we've taken advantage of this to actually 3D print the metal. So this is a video that shows, again, a, kind of gives you a sense of how this stuff behaves. This is a syringe. We take a droplet, we pull the liquid back in, and you see the uh, oxide kind of crumple. The oxide forms so fast and is so strong that you can take droplets and stack them, which is pretty interesting. So one of the neat things here is that sort of for the first time, you can 3D print metals at room temperature. So you can print them with plastics, elastomers, uh, biological materials, etc. cetera. And um, in addition to stacking droplets, you can also do a burst of pressure. So we'll shoot it out of here, and it oxidizes so fast that it holds its shape, sort of like Spider-Man. And the other interesting thing is because it's a liquid, we can drag it around and make electrical connections. And then, I don't know if you can tell, but this is a dead bug, dead insect. So these are the eyes. And it held still for a little bit for us to 3D print some antennas <laughs> on it. So this is about as close as we get to biomedical research in our lab. Um, my student actually did this as a joke because we do some work with liquid metal antennas. Um, but I really like it because it shows just how small these structures are. They're about 100 microns. And also just how gentle this printing process is. So in addition to 3D printing, you can 2D print. This is basically just dragging a needle across the surface. And again, this is liquid the entire time. This is all held together by a very, very thin oxide layer. A simpler way to pattern the metal is to simply inject it. So this is a microfluidic channel. Basically, there's a hole here, there's an outlet hole here, and there's a channel that connects them. We apply pressure with our thumb. You'll see it flow through, pop up right there. And then we're going to do it again from here to here. So you'll see it flow through and pop up. And so just that simply, we just made a wire, we just made an antenna, depends on how you look at it. But this is interesting for a couple reasons. One, it's a new fabrication paradigm. So typically you form, say, a metal and then encapsulate it with some polymer. Here we're starting with the polymer and then adding the metal to it. Uh, secondly is these wires that form take on the mechanical properties of the polymer. So if you inject this into a rubber band, you have a rubber band-like wire. And so that's shown here. These are different types of antennas. This is a dipole antenna. This is a coil antenna for wireless power transfer. And these take on the, the mechanical properties of the polymer that they're within. We've also made uh, microfluidic electrodes. If there's uh, those in the audience that are interested in microfluidics, this is kind of nice because in one step, we can make uh, electrodes that are perfectly aligned and adjacent to microfluidic channels in a single lith lithographic step. But it turns out it's even easier to pattern this material, and we're really excited about this. Um, this, this video is going to show you uh, sort of the idea. 
So these are microfluidic channels. They're a little bit hard to see, but you can kind of faintly see them. Currently they're empty, and we've pulled vacuum on this material, and there's one hole, there's an inlet hole that's sitting underneath this blob of metal. So when we pull vacuum, that pulls all the air out, and then when I I'll start the video, you'll see that the student, this is a reflection of the student right there, comes, turns a knob, and lets the air in. You'll see the thing will vibrate because the air is coming in. Now there's atmospheric pressure pushing here, and that pushes it spontaneously into the microchannels. So you can fill it very, very simply with no hands. Okay, so I mentioned that these type of structures take on the mechanical properties of the surrounding materials. And this is important if you're trying to make a stretchable conductor. So there was a review article from a few years ago that said if you want a stretchable conductor, of course the things you, you care about are electrical conductance and making it go to a large strain. How far can you stretch it? So this is a plot of conductivity versus strain. So if you imagine taking something that's very stretchy, like a piece of rubber, right? and you want to make it conductive, you can start putting in particles like this. Start putting in particles and having them start to overlap. And if you do that enough, you start to make it conductive. But the more you add, uh, the more conductive you make it, but the less you can stretch it. This is kind of a general trade-off with composite materials. So these squares are data from the literature and shows the general trade-off. Where you'd really like to be, uh, depending on the application, is, is way up here. High strain, high conductivity. And we can do that with these wires. So these are some hollow, basically hollow tubes that we filled with liquid metal right here. And there is sound. I'm not sure if this is going to play. Maybe not. OK. Well, I'm sorry you can't hear the sound. But basically, as we stretch these things, we can go to 800% strain or more and still have metallic conductivity. In other words, we break the trade off. We've decoupled mechanical properties and electrical properties. We sort of get the best of both worlds. More recently, we've taken these stretchy wires and combined them. So this is actually three wires and filled them with different lengths of metal. And by doing that, we can do capacitive sensing between our finger and the fibers to create stretchable fiber touch sensors. And so um, it's kind of a simple idea, but basically it allows you to do capacitive touch sensing in a fiber, stretchable fiber form, which is kind of cool. And originally I wasn't planning to show this, but given the interest in, in optics and some of the folks here, um, one of the interesting things that we notice is that um, with these microfluidic channels that are filled with liquid metal, we found that when we grabbed them, we would start to see some color that would appear on these edges. And we were just curious, why is this happening? Well, it turns out if you fill one of these channels with liquid metal and squeeze it, you can actually get buckling uh, that forms a diffraction grating. So this is a, a video that shows the concept. So this is the, the liquid metal, and it appears kind of dark because there's not much light coming off the surface. But when you squeeze it, you buckle the surface, and because it's a metal, it, um, it reflects the light, and you get this diffraction grating effect, and then when you let it go, it goes back to being flat. So when you squeeze it, you get buckles, and then you go back to being flat. And although it's not a perfect analogy, um, you can say that this is a little bit like the, the so-called morpho butterfly that, that obtains its color based on its nanostructuring. And so here we're able to make gratings in a very soft material that can change based on how you squeeze it. It's kind of interesting. And then finally, I'm showing you kind of all the gee whiz stuff, but finally uh, another interesting thing is you can take these liquid metal wires and in this case, we've got a very simple circuit. There's a battery that lights up an LED. And we come in with a pair of scissors and cut this. And you'll see that, of course, we break it electrically and we break it mechanically. If you focus your attention here, though, you'll see that the, the liquid doesn't come out. It also doesn't retract. It stays flush with that interface due to the formation of that oxide. So now when you bring it back together, the oxide is very thin, so the thing will break, go back together and regain its electrical conductivity. And then the polymer is designed such that it's held together by hydrogen bonds. And so if you give it a little bit of time, you just wait about 10 minutes, those bonds will wiggle around, find each other, and regain its original mechanical uh, modulus. 
and so you can pull on it. It's also stretchable, which is kind of interesting. All right, one last, one last sort of GWIS thing, and then there's um, sort of a twist to the story. Um, one other kind of cool thing you can do with this liquid metal is you can make little particles of it. So what we do is we just take the liquid metal and put it in some solvent, and we sonicate it, basically blast it with, uh, with acoustic energy. And it breaks it into these little droplets. These are about 100, 100 nanometers or so. And so it forms this suspension. And then we can cast it as a film. And as you might imagine, it's, these films are not very conductive because the electrons have to hop through all these particles. But anyway, if we, cat, if we put them in elastomer, we can squeeze them and cause the little particles to merge together because they're liquid. And so to show this concept, this is uh, one of these structures. So these are the particles between two layers of elastomer. We've stuck two copper wires and an LED, and we've shown that it's not conducting. But then you can take a pin. This is, the pin is just to apply pressure. You could use your finger. And you push on it, and that causes the particles to merge together. So it's basically centering at room temperature. And it allows you to create these conductive pathways. And so now you'll see it's conductive. And so if you hook up a power supply, it will light up. So basically, you can draw circuits on the fly, which is kind of cool. But to me, the coolest thing with using liquid metal is the idea that you can change its shape. And so the question is, how do you do this? How do you change the shape of the metal? The simplest way, as I've already shown you, is to do mechanical. So just grab it, stretch it, bend it, something like that. Um, but I'm a chemical engineer, and we like pumps. So we would like to do it using air or some kind of pump. Uh, but the problem with that, and this is where the oxide is actually a problem, the oxide sticks to the walls of these, these channels. So if you, if you took this liquid metal microchannel and tried to, to pull the liquid metal out, you would see that the oxide and the, the metal inside of it sticks to these walls. So it's a little bit like wet paint. So it's difficult to kind of you know, move it around. And besides, we'd really like to be able to do it electrically because then you could do miniaturization. Okay, so how do we do it? We used electrochemistry. So this is a puddle of the liquid metal. And we've put it in salt water. And then we take two electrodes with a battery and apply a voltage. And here, instead of using acid to remove the oxide, we use electrochemistry to reduce it, basically this reaction. When the oxide goes away, the metal goes to high surface tension state, and it beads up. So how can we use this? Well, this is a microchannel filled with liquid metal. And there's a drop of water here. We apply a voltage between here and here. And you see that the oxide goes away at that interface, causing it to want to withdraw to this reservoir. Although the video doesn't show it, at any point we can turn the voltage off and stop the flow. You'll see that it leaves no residue behind, so it withdraws cleanly. And then this part, which is not in the electrical path, uh, regains its stability because it reoxidizes, so it holds, it holds its shape. So using this concept, we can actually kind of one-up our game a little bit, and we can make a maze. So this is, again, liquid metal. There's a droplet of water at the outlet, a droplet of liquid metal at the inlet, and we apply a voltage. And the liquid metal will actually solve the maze because it follows the electrical path. Basically, we're only removing the oxide right here, and it will withdraw and find this, the solution. Now, the, um, you know, this is kind of cute and maybe sort of obvious. That is that if you remove the oxide, it should want to beat up and go to this, this outlet here. But what we'd really like is a way to get it to go back in. And here in this video, we applied a negative voltage here, a reducing potential. But we, you might think kind of intuitively, well, what if I apply a positive potential? Could I then get it to go back in? And the, the, the problem with that is that the oxide should just form and nothing should happen. So you can imagine how excited we were when we did this experiment. So if you apply a positive potential to the liquid metal, so this is the liquid metal, it's sitting in electrolyte and there's a, a counter electrode out here, we found that the metal spreads. And a couple interesting things are, are occurring. If you look at the leading edge, it's actually not wetting. It's actually got a non-wetting contact angle. Um, this got this little stem that connects between the syringe and the, met and the liquid metal, so that's also weird. And it's spreading like a pancake. So this, everything about this is surprising uh, and should be very kind of shocking. And if you, you can basically do the same experiment 
And if you look top down and put the metal into a mold, you'll see that it will spread into the mold. And so you can get these different shapes because it's spreading into the mold. And then when you flip the voltage, it will bead back up. So you can start tuning the shape, which is kind of cool. Now this should be very, very surprising because liquid metals have enormous surface tension. Um, most organics, say you go to the you know, petrol, get some petrol, it's 20 to 30. That's a typical value. Water, because it's very polar, is about 72. Now don't, don't worry about the unit so much, just look at the numbers. Gallium has the largest surface tension of any liquid at room temperature, as far as I know. And it's about 500. And so th what this means is that it tends to want to form a sphere. And so we first thought, well, we're applying a voltage in the presence of water. This must be electrocapillarity. This is a phenomenon that's been known since the 1800s. And let me walk you through you know, what, what this could potentially be. So this is a plot of surface tension versus voltage. And one of kind of the weird things um, about electrochemistry, electrochemistry, there's these so-called open circuit voltages. So it doesn't go through zero. It's got this um, you know, number offset from zero. But anyway, if you imagine this to be your droplet of mercury and it's sitting in water, the two things really don't like each other. And so the, the mercury has a very high surface tension it wants to beat up. But one way to trick them to like each other is to apply a little bit of potential to the metal. So if you imagine you apply a, a positive potential or a negative potential, either way, you're going to get the counter ions. So these are the counter ions that go to that surface and effectively lower the surface tension. It makes those interfaces like each other. Now, looking at this, what does this look like uh, in terms of electrical engineering? Resistor, inductor, capacitor, right? So this is a capacitive effect. And so basically the equation that describes is the surface tension is equal to that at, at the max, the point of zero charge, so up here where there's no charge, minus one half CV squared. That's just a capacitor. And you see it's voltage squared, which means it should be symmetric. It doesn't matter if you go positive or negative. Either way, you should get this, this effect. Now, you might look at this equation and say, oh, this is great. If I want to make the surface tension zero, I just make a very large voltage. But what's the problem with that? What's the problem if you apply a large voltage in water? Electrolysis, exactly. So there's actually a window here where if you go too far this way, you get hydrogen bubbles, and too far this way, you get oxygen bubbles. And so there's a limit to how far you can go. And so you'll see that here in this example, uh, it goes from 600 down to about 500. Now that's actually a huge change in surface tension, but you're still at a very large tension at the end of the day. It's a bit like going from a 100-story building to an 80-story building. That's, that's a big change, but you're still at 80 stories. So my point is, this is still a very large surface tension. Okay, so for a number of reasons, we do not think it's electrocapillarity. So I just spent a lot of time telling you what it's not. Uh, it's not electrocapillarity because when we apply positive voltage, it spreads like a pancake. And negative voltage, it beads up. And in fact, you can see hydrogen bubbles coming off of the surface. So it's not electrocapillarity. So what, what is it? So we decided to do our own measurements. And we assume that there's two forces. One is surface tension or interfacial tension which wants the droplet to, to do this. It wants to minimize its surface area. The other is gravity, which wants it to flatten, like a pancake. And so based on the balance of these, we can figure out what the, the surface tension is. We know the density of the liquid, so we know this force. All we need to do is look at the shape, and we can get the surface tension. So here's our experiment. This is a plot of the, the surface tension on this axis versus the voltage that we apply. Again, apologies, it's kind of the weird thing about electrochemistry, but at the so-called open circuit voltage, this is just what Mother Nature gives us, we get negative 1.5 volts. So if you're sitting there, and this is, I left off a key detail, this is sitting in base. The base removes the oxide, so this is the bare metal, and at this, the bare metal has a very large surface tension. Now, in this experiment, we're going to apply a voltage, and there's a very small wire that pokes right here and contacts the droplet. And so we're going to look at it from the side, and we're going to hit go. So let's see. So we apply a voltage, and we apply a little voltage. You see the drop starts to squish, which means the surface tension is getting lower. And then we can go back. We can go back. And basically you can see as a function of potential, very small potentials, I might add, we're getting huge changes in surface tension. And so 
If you look in this region, this looks like a straight line, but it's actually a parabola. This is the classic behavior you would expect from the 1800s. Okay, so this is really not all that interesting. Um, this is just the capacitive effect that I mentioned on the previous slide. What is weird is that instead of being a parabola like this, something funny happens right here. The question is why? So we did an electrochemical measurement. I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but it's called cyclic voltammetry. We're basically measuring current versus voltage. And when we see a little bump in our, in our measurement, that means there's something reacting on the surface. And so where that little bump occurs, that's where the oxide is forming. And so if we draw a dotted line down, it's at about negative 1.4, and we draw that same dotted line here, that's exactly where we see this drop. Okay, I've said a lot of words, but the bottom line is we're seeing anomalous behavior where the oxide forms. Okay, and we see this big drop in intention. Now the question is why? We actually think there's two reasons. The first is we think the oxide is acting like a surfactant. So a surfactant is nothing more than a molecule or, or something, some species that goes to an interface and lowers the tension. We see this in our day-to-day -day lives. For example, if you have oil and water, these two things hate each other, right? But if you add soap, surfactant, it makes them like each other and you can disperse it. Now, you know from experience, it's very easy to put soap in the water but how do you get it back out? It's not so easy. In our case, we apply a positive voltage, we deposit our surfactant, and negative voltage, we make it go away and it beads back up. Okay, so why should it behave like a surfactant? Well, if you look at oil and water, so again, imagine this is water from the, you know, the, the spout, and this is the oil maybe on your hands that you wanna remove. If you want to make them like each other, use the soap molecule that's a little bit confused. There's this part that is ionic, that likes the water, and there's this part that likes the oil. So it's sort of holding hands between enemies. Now in our case, if we could de design a surfactant, and you can tell I'm not a chemist because a chemist would not draw a molecule this way, but if we could design a surfactant, we'd want to put hydroxyl groups by the water and gallium by the liquid metal. This is like the best you could do. Now, of course, this molecule doesn't exist, but Mother Nature gives us the oxide, and the oxide is asymmetric. So what I'm showing here is gallium and oxygen, oxygen is these circles, that sort of zigzag back and forth, terminating in hydroxyls here, terminating in gallium here. So this is about the best you could hope for. Now, to give you an appreciation for, for how big of a change of surface tension this is, uh, this is a plot from the literature of surface tension of water so remember, water is about 70, and if you start adding soap, so it's called SDS, it's the name of the molecule, you start adding soap, you lower the surface tension as you put more soap on the surface, but at some point, you just, you can't put any more. It's kind of maximized. And at that point, the surface tension is about 40. So that delta is maybe 30. And if you put that same delta of 30 on our plot, it's like this little guy right here. Okay, so this should give you an appreciation for how much we're changing the surface tension. Soap changes it by 30, we're going from about 500 to almost zero. Now, <clears throat> when you look at this data, you should be a little bit mad at either me or my graduate student, because gosh, doesn't that look like it's about to go to zero? Why did we stop? So if we go to right here, something very interesting happens. In fact, we think it's going close to zero. So just to show you what happens, um, I call this the drippy faucet experiment. So we've got a tube with liquid metal that we're going to pump. And with a drippy faucet, you've got surface tension that holds your liquid there and gravity, which is pulling it down. And so we're going to pump the metal. And so here's the metal. Here's the tube. We're going to pump it. And you're going to see it drip. And again, we're in base. So you see it drip, drip, drip. And then as soon as we apply a voltage between here and here, we deposit the oxide, it has this surfactant-like effect, the tension is very low, and it comes out like a straight. You guys are so hard to impress. <laughs> I almost fell out of my chair when I saw this. This is very unexpected. Uh, so this overcomes what's called Rayleigh instabilities. If you turn on your faucet, you know, you can get a stream of liquid, but eventually it will break into droplets due to surface tension. And we're actually still trying to understand this, but let me show you sort of where we're at. We're doing this with Karen Daniels at NC State. So we designed an experiment where, again, we have a very small wire that contacts our liquid metal, and it's sitting in base, which is constantly etching off the oxide. 
We put a counter electrode around the outside so that we avoid any sort of um, fringing fields. And we're again, we're kind of probing what happens when you apply this voltage. Now in this experiment, you're, the camera is looking top down. So here's our droplet and we apply a voltage and it starts to spread, flatten out like a pancake. But it actually starts to form very strange, these fingering instabilities, uh, which turn out to be a little bit different than normal fingering instabilities. Uh, these form fractals and it will continue to spread and you'll see that sometimes these little um, lines will break and when they do the oxide dissolves away and they beat up. So you can see that when the oxide goes away it beads up. Um, and telling the story would probably take um, the full hour so let me just tell you what we think is happening. So normally liquids are under tension. They get pulled together like this. It's like a, like a rubber band being stretched. They're under tension. And we think there's two things. I mentioned the surfactant. So remember, they've got this oxide on the surface, which we think lowers the interfacial tension of the liquid that's sitting beneath it. So that's one thing. So we've lowered the tension, but that doesn't make the tension necessarily zero. We think there's a second effect, which is that um, if you imagine your oxide to be like this, you've got a very big field sitting across that oxide. There's a big voltage drop, and that's driving ions in through the oxide. Okay, and when you do that, it's very much like driving a wedge into a piece of wood. It creates a compressive force which wants this thing to spread outwards. And I could probably do a better job convincing you uh, if I had a whole another hour, but um, we have some experiments that suggest this, and the combination of the surfactant plus this oxidative stress is what allows the metal to do this really unusual spreading. I was going to transition by showing you this video, but I don't think the sounds works. Do you guys know who this is? It's a late night comedian in the US, Seth Meyers. Anyway, he mentioned on TV our, our work, and he said that um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to come back in time to stop our research. <laughs> so anyway, so that's where I usually stop this part. And hopefully I've shown you that you know, in addition to mercury, there's these other liquid metals based on gallium. They form surface oxides. And that surface oxide allows us to pattern the metal, metal by 3D printing, injecting into microfluidics, kind of unconventional ways of patterning metals. And in addition, using electrochemistry, we can sh do some shape, shape reconfiguration of the metal, get it to spread and to contract. Now, if I have just maybe five more minutes, I'd like to just show you the other part of my group, which is work uh, being done on polymers, polymer actuation. And so this has nothing to do with liquid metal, so we're making kind of a complete uh, diversion here, but the, uh, the motivation for what we're trying to do is basically converting 2D patterning into 3D shapes. Now I saw, uh, I had a nice tour this morning of your microfab, and all that, mi the microfab is basically designed to do essentially 2D or 2.5D structures. Basically making computer chips is a 2D process. Same thing with inkjet printing, roll-to-roll -roll printing, some of you are wearing t-shirts that were screen printed, all of these are, are inherently 2D, and they're very inexpensive per pixel. So the question is, how can we take these processes and make 3D shapes? And we do this by what we call self-folding. So this is a, I'm going to show you the video, and then I'll explain what's happening. But this is a piece of very inexpensive plastic patterned with black ink. And we're going to take light and shine light on it, get it to fold. Man, you guys are so tough. <laughs> Maybe it's like too close to lunch or something. Um, so that's a real-time video, so it happens quite f fast. And basically what we're doing is we're taking these sheets of plastic, and the key idea is that they've been pre-strained, which means they've been stretched. Okay, but these ones have been biaxially pre-strained, which means they've been stretched this way and this way. If you put them, this is a picture of one of these sheets, if you put this in the oven, it would shrink, in this case, 50% this way, 50% this way. But rather than doing that, Rather than putting in the oven, we first draw on them. So the black is literally could just be ink. So this is my computer monitor in my office. This is my printer in my office. The black ink is literally from a printer. And we shine light on it using a very simple light. In this case, it's an IR lamp that we buy from a hardware store. So this whole experiment costs about $10. <laughs> and anyway, you can put the ink on the top or the bottom. And either way, wherever the ink is, the sheet gets hot. So this is a way to localize heat on a surface. And when you do that, you can get folds very, very quickly because it gets hot wherever the ink is. 
And I didn't realize this at the time, but this, uh, this allows you to do what's called mountain folds if, in the world of origami. So mountain folds and valley folds. So this made people, you know, there's like 10 people in the world that love origami and it made all of them very, very happy. <laughs> um, so, but scientifically the advance here is we um, are using a class of materials called shape memory polymers. And this sounds, you know, like these materials are smart. Uh, but all it is is just this material has been stretched to some temporary shape and when you heat it, it goes back to its original shape. Very much like if you took a rubber band and stretched it and let it go, it's going to go back. It's a similar concept. But here we use the same initial shape and based on how we 2D print it, we can make a variety of 3D shapes. Uh, you don't have to pattern the ink, you can actually pattern the light. So and this is showing what I, did, what I showed you previously, which is the light going everywhere and the ink localizing the, the absorption. You can also put the ink everywhere and, and focus the light. So this experiment um, shows there's, there's a laser over here, which you can't see. It goes through a lens, a lens, and then there's a, a shutter. And if you would please focus your, your, your attention on this sample. And we're going to shine the light. Oh, there's sound now. Huh. Maybe it's my computer. So, yeah, so that was a good day for a grad student. <laughs> they were very happy. Uh, you can also use microwaves. So we had a lot of fun sticking things in the microwave that you're not supposed to. Um, and the thing that ended up working the best, I know graphene is kind of a hot material, but it just turned out graphene worked very well for us. So we screen printed some graphene ink, and based on the width of the hinge, we were able to get a variety of different angles. Um, and then more recently, we've been using color. So this kind of gets into color theory. But the basic idea is shown here. If you pattern yellow ink and blue ink, based on the uh, light that you expose it to, you can control the order with which you fold. So this allows you to make more complex structures. So this video shows the idea. This is um, a sample that's got yellow and blue ink. And as you shine different colors of light, you can control which one folds and which one does not. So this is the same sample uh, shined with different sequences of light. And then uh, this just shows that you can use different combinations of colors. So different colors of LEDs, different colors of ink. And so in this example, we fold and sequence three different panels. And then here, we, based on the absorption, we can get it to kind of do these overlapping folds, which would not be possible if you did all of these at the same time. And so with that, I'll just summarize very briefly to say, uh, hopefully I've shown you some interesting work from our lab. I'll try to go kind of high level just to show you the, the GWIS stuff, but I'd be happy to answer any questions in, in more detail afterwards. Uh, I've shown you our work on liquid metals as well as some work that we're doing in our lab on actuating polymers. And I'd like to thank the students who did, I think literally almost all the work I showed you today. So um, I'm the one that's lucky to, to come to beautiful Switzerland and. Um, Really, I, I owe a lot of thanks to them as well as collaborators, which I've tried to mention along the way, but I highlight again here. And I'd also like to thank uh, the funding sources that made this possible and you for your attention. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, please. I can repeat it if you want. Yeah, I guess, um, so how do you envision the use of these fingering instabilities outside the scope of um, soft switching? Yeah, so uh, to be honest, when we started all this, what we really wanted to do was to take a droplet of the metal and spread it out into a sheet because that would be a lot more useful. <laughs> and that's difficult to do because these instabilities occur. Um, and so I think the reality is, there's, um, at least for me, maybe I'm not smart enough to think of the applications, but um, the thing that to me that's more interesting is the mechanism, which is new. And also, uh, there's a lot of people that study these types of fingering instabilities. So there's these things called Healy-Shaw cells, where you inject a low viscosity liquid into a more viscous liquid, and they also form fingers. Uh, lightning strikes also form these kind of fractal. And so uh, people that have studied these have found this kind of universality uh, fractal shape. And we're seeing a, actually a different behavior 
that um, is different from all the others. And so, and we don't know why. And so we're still, we've mainly been focusing on the fundamentals, trying to understand how this thing works. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure about good applications. It's a good question. Yes, please. Well, 3, 3D print. So I see some uh, uh, spheres so getting can touch each other. Right. So this mechanism is due to the oxide layer or the uh, liquid metal in two spheres with each other. Yeah, so the question basically is during the 3D printing, what happens when you bring two spheres together, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm smiling because I get asked that like like 99% of the time that I show that video. Um, and we don't have a very good answer other than to say if you bring two droplets together very gently and bring them back apart, you can pull them apart. But anything other than that, they actually will merge together. And once they're merged together and you pull on them, it's, it's like pulling bubble gum. They've, they've merged together. Um, and we've captured that with high-speed camera. So you can actually see, you know, if you just put two, two spheres on each other, they're going to both look like perfectly round, but if you look, um, when they touch, it actually expands a little bit in the middle, which means that there's a, a liquid bridge. So I think what happens if you, if you take a round surface and try to make it flat, uh, you have to break that surface. You know, it's like trying to wrap, the opposite would be trying to wrap, say, a um, piece of paper around a football, right? You have to wrinkle the material. And the same thing is true here. If you take a round surface, make it flat, it's going to break. So I think the oxide breaks and then the, the liquid connects. And at that point, it's, it's connected. Now what happens to the oxide that was there? I don't know if it crumples up or if it like diffuses to the surface. Um, my guess is it's probably just kind of floats around and gets crumpled up. But it's, it's definitely connected. Like you, you can't get them back apart. So it's, uh, the should be a conformal path. Oh, for sure. Very conductive. E even, actually, even if they don't merge together, they form nice conformal interface and it's still pretty conductive. Yep. Another question? Yes, please. Yes, so I mean one of the ideas with the liquid metal is that you could, a couple things, is you could embed it inside of structures, say like a wing of a, um, you know, unmanned aircraft or something. And then by having just that, uh, the metal, you could deploy it when you need it, so you can make it into an antenna and then have it come back so that you either couldn't detect it or maybe have it go into a different shape to have different types of antennas or communication devices. Um, so that was kind of one of the one of the ideas there. Yep. I think there's a lot of challenges though, so don't worry. <laughs> in, in one of the examples you showed, you cut the polymer with the liquid metal inside, and right. then you mentioned hydrogen bonds that the self healing went a bit faster. Well, can you expand a bit on that? Yep. So so there's two there's two different things. There's the healing of the metal which is just simply what we were just talking about. If you bring two droplets together, that things merge back together. Same thing happens here. You bring those interfaces together and it, and it merges. So you get, I mean, the, the resistivity before and after is the same within like a percent or something like that. Uh, so so but it's the metal healing or the polymer healing? Both, so the metal and the polymer healing. So this is what I was about to say. So the metal, the metal is just going together by physical contact. And then the polymer is held together. It's, um, so we didn't develop it. We're, we're actually using this. This is a polymer developed by uh, Ludwig, Ludwig Leidler. It's a 2008 Nature paper. And um, basically, they use hydrogen bonds. And so you know, if I cut my shirt or anything, any object in this room and try to bring it back together, there's no hope for it to go back together. But these molecules have enough mobility that they can, first of all, they can move. And they've got hydrogen bonds. So when you're cutting it, you're just, you're, it's like pulling a zipper apart, and they can go back together. Now, one of the downsides, if you, if you pull them apart and wait too long, the hydrogen bonds are high energy, so they actually will turn and go back, yes, and then it won't heal. Um, but as long as you put it together within like 10 minutes or so, you're fine. So if you want to rewire something, you snip, sip, and put it together. Yeah, thanks. Yes, please. It seems you have uh, centimeter scale structures using reconfigurable structures you, you are making them. My question is: Can you make them? Uh, can you make them like micrometer scale, or what? Should, what could be the limitations if you want them micrometer size? Okay. So, 
Um, so there's kind of two, two parts to this answer. One is how can you pattern the metal that small? And um, there are some examples in the literature, not in the electronic space, but where people have played with these materials and they've injected it into capillaries that are about 100 nanometers in diameter. The question there is how much pressure are you comfortable applying? Uh, basically, the, the smaller the channel is, the more the pressure is. So to get it to go into a 10 micron channel is about one atmosphere of pressure. One micron would be 10 atmospheres. Um, and so that's, that's simply by injecting. Uh, people have gotten it to go into carbon nanotubes through, I call black magic. They basically sprinkle in some carbon, some gallium, and then they heat it and somehow it ends up inside. Um, and so that's probably the limit. That's a few nanometers. Um, there's some new patterning strategies, which are not done by my group. There's others I can show you that have patterned it down to a few microns uh, using some stamping techniques. Um, so there are ways to pattern it. Now for the reconfigurable part, um, that gets more difficult because, uh, and there's a couple of different ways to reconfigure. I only showed one. Um, probably the, the easiest way if you just want to move metal back and forth is a technique called continuous electrowetting. And in that case, um, we actually haven't tried to scale it down, but people, other groups have done, um, you know, tens of microns. Um, but with electrochemistry is tricky because there's chemical reactions. You also have the oxide on the surface, and so it creates problems. And so my guess in that case is it's more millimeter to 100 micron length scale limit. Yeah. I wish it could go smaller, but I think you probably run into some problems. Yes. Could it be, you've got, the, there's an oxide on the outside which has always been dissolved away. Is that right? There's a, yeah, so there's a competition. You're always dissolving, but you're always depositing. So, yep. so, so that's what allows it to flow. Otherwise, you just form it and it just wouldn't go anywhere. So could it be that you've got cracks, which is then you get cracks and it flows through and that forms your fingers? So it's that equilibrium between the the dissolving of the oxide layer and the desire of the material to flow under gravity that leads to those kind of fingering instabilities, and that's why it's different from the others? So, I mean, maybe. I mean, that, that, could, be, that could be part of it. We've definitely, I could show you some videos, but we've, um, if you do it in salt water where you're not etching away the oxide, you'll see it just forms a crust, and then you'll see like little places where it will like kind of shoot through. Um, so there's probably, there probably are weak points that sort of seed where this stuff goes. But, um, but the, the element that I think is a little bit more complicated is that the metal itself does have high surface tension. So it, there's got to be something that's allowing it to assume more and more area. So if you, I don't have the data in front of me, but if you plot the area versus time, it just goes like that, which means that there's no penalty for forming more area. Now liquid metals by themselves, there's nothing that would drive them to, to do that. They'd really, they want to actually minimize their area. And so there's got to be something that's, I mean, gravity to a point will drive it. Uh, but at some point, even if it's a very small surface tension, it will stop spreading. And so we're, we think that we're actually driving the surface tension to zero or even below. Um, if you dissolve away the oxide, then the metal will just bead back up. Yeah. So, but you do need that in order to get these instabilities. That's why it's so darn complicated. <laughs> and I thought if I went into too much detail, I'd put everyone to sleep, but. <laughs> We're still trying to understand it. So, I mean, any, these kinds of things are very helpful. Any other questions? Oh, yes, please. Is it still stretchable when temperature lower than melting point, like 30 degrees? Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, is it still stretchable? If we use gallium, gallium melts at 30 degrees, is it still stretchable? Uh, another interesting thing about these materials is that they've got, they can super cool, uh, which means that, say, gallium melts at 30, but it freezes at, depends on how you do it, but can freeze as low as negative 30. I mean, that's incredible. Um, so we've had some of these stretchable wires that in principle should be solid at room temperature and I've left them in a freezer at negative 14 Celsius for months and they'd never froze. 
So, but it, you know, if that is a problem, there's other metals you can put into the alloy, like zinc or tin, that will actually depress the melting point even further. We've just never seen the need to because a binary system is simpler than a tertiary or, um, yeah. Do you think it's spontaneous crystallization if you stretch it? <laughs> I wish, because that would be so cool. Um, no, but if you, if you poke it uh, with a wire and you give it a nucleation point, you can actually see it freeze and then it becomes solid, which is also really neat to see. The Galea one, I tried to cut the uh, liquid out of minus 18. Yeah, so I, I mean, from what I've read in the literature, you can go as much as 60 below the, the freezing point, but, or melting point. But yeah, okay, that's good. <laughs> I've actually never seen gallium indium frozen. I've never really tried, but it's very difficult to freeze. All right, uh, I think uh, after this great talk and the great discussions, uh, it's the time uh, to thank uh, our speaker again. Thank and you. for those who are joining for lunch, so we will meet uh, just outside and continue over. So thanks a lot for joining us here. Thank you.